Good morning and good afternoon to all of you that have logged in. My name is Suda David Wilp. I'm with the German Marshall Fund of the United States Berlin office. And on behalf of the uh, two organizations that are cooperating with us today, the American Council on Germany and the Atlantic Brooka, I'd like to welcome you to today's election readout. Um, a little less than uh, 24 hours after the polls have closed in Germany uh, yesterday. We have three sessions today for all of you. The first session is going to be a very sort of quick session uh, with uh, two experts on the results. We'll unpack the results for you, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. But if not, there will be ample opportunity to pose questions in the second and third session. The second session is comprised of foreign politicians who will offer their insight on what happens next in Germany as um, the policymakers enter coalition talks. And we'll end with a session on Germany's um, role in the world with two renowned journalists. So let's get started. And as I mentioned, please send your questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to them shortly. I'm very pleased to have uh, two experts to kick things off with. Uh, Julia Reichenbach is a lecturer and political scientist at the Uni Bonn. She's joined today uh, by Janina Mutza, who is the CEO and founder of CIVE. Uh, she told me beforehand that it basically combines the word citizen and survey. So we're really glad to have both of you with us. I'm going to just start off with a very general question. Um, this election has been very, very fluid. Um, there are lots of movement over the summer. Um, at one point, different parties were leading the pack. Uh, but, you know, in the last two weeks or so, the polls sort of um, tightened and we came up with a result that kind of mirrored the preliminary official results that we now have. Um, Janina, why don't we start with you? Were the polls correct and what were your initial reactions to the vote yesterday and uh, were you surprised by anything? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, the polls were correct, if uh, one can say so. So, of course, polls are never a prognosis, but um, polling at the moment uh, they 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 run. But um, all the polls um, that were published in the last week actually saw um, the result more or less that we uh, that came out uh, early this morning. So um, I wasn't surprised by the result. I was, but I have been surprised quite often during the campaign this year because there was a lot of fluctuation um, in this year. We had um, three chancellor candidates from the Greens, from the Conservative Party and from the Social Democrats. And all of them have been ahead at any moment, like at one moment um, during the last month. Um, and we haven't seen that in Germany beforehand. And there was a lot of um, fluctuation in, in the polls and there was a lot of movement and um, yeah, there, so in the result now, I wasn't surprised during the campaign. Yes, I was. And Julia, what do you think? I mean, were you surprised with the results? And, um, you know, is this situation with just a um, less than a two percentage point lead right now with the SPD um, something that's unprecedented or has this happened before in Germany? Yes, uh, thank you also for having me here. Here. And um, no, I wasn't surprised, like Janina told, um, the uh, poll ratings last week were very next to the results. And um, I, I was a little bit surprised um, from something, uh, if we um, have a look at the, at the parties, especially at the CDU, um, that they uh, were, it was really maybe a little bit shocking because they they lost um, in main um, topics um, so many percent um, in economics in international relations or international politics and that were the main uh, topics of this party for so many years and I think this is really um, a, a bad situation and a situation the party has to to talk about and to think about. It's not only the candidate, it's not only Armin Laschet and his problems in the campaign. Janina uh, told the campaigns were all a little bit crazy, each of uh, each um, part. And um, I think um, if you, what you said, um, no, it's not so um, 
it's not only 2021. 20, uh, we got in history also other situations, 2002, 2005, when um, the big catch all parties and this time um, were um, next to each other. Um, one year, the SPD was also with three mandates uh, uh, in, in position one. So it's not so surprising this year. Um, much more surprising for me is the situation that Olaf Scholz um, got this this movement, this this one moment in time, a little bit dramatic, um, <laughs> coming from 14%, 14% in July this year and going to, to 25 now. So this is really a um a, a movement and uh, that was um yeah maybe a little bit incredible i think janina i really like the theme song that you just coined for the <laughs> schultz campaign we'll have to let ralph brinker know about it maybe he can use it in his next commercial but janina let's get our get back to i'm sorry yulia but janina can we get back to uh, voter sentiments i mean yulia mentioned um the different topics that used to be sort of under the purview of the cdu but voters in this election cycle really thought that climate was very important. Um, 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 you know, income inequality is perhaps another one, just sort of the future of the German economy. Um, these are things that voters were thinking about. International issues, not so much, more kitchen table issues as well as migration, although, so that straddles both. But what were the voter sentiments? Were they then um, confirmed at the polls yesterday? Um, were there movements in the voters' uh, choices? And I mean, I guess, could you say that this was a win for the center in Germany? Um, let's start maybe with a topic. So you're completely right that uh, climate, uh, climate politics uh, and climate change was one of the major topics for the voters. At least they, they thought at the beginning of the campaigns that this would uh, be the most discussed topic in this year's election campaign. That was the expectation um, the voters had. Um, they thought it would be it would be climate change. It would be economics uh, and labor, and it would be social security. Um, if you ask voters what's the most important topic for you and what influences your voting decision, it's rather the social security first, so pensions and um, yeah, the social security. It's uh, the economic situation and the climate change. Um, so the climate change really came into the center of German politics. It has been there already before the corona um, crisis, before the corona pandemic. Uh, we talked a lot about climate politics and it disappeared due to the pandemic, but it came back. And um, in the end, at the end of the campaign, 72% of the voters, uh, voters thought that we didn't discuss enough topics in the campaign because we concentrated so much on the candidates. There was so much trouble in nominating a candidate for the Conservative Party, for the CDU, CSU, um, and uh, there were mistakes in the campaigns of the greens um they didn't manage like um, they did when well prepared and they had like uh, some scandals in the beginning of the campaign and like so all the media focus a lot on these uh, candidates rather than on on the topics and um, voters were disappointed on that um in the end what is interesting is that um more then 50% of the voters wanted to have like a change in politics. They, they like in Germany, it doesn't mean that you really want to have like a new something completely new, but it was enough of uh, of like a CDU led a great coalition. Um, so there had to be a change. And on the other hand, we know Germans, they really also like security and something they can rely on. And it was really interesting because um, Olaf Scholz was, has become somehow the, the, the figure, like the person who could combine that because um, he, for in, the, in, in the eyes of the voter, he stands now for the, um, yeah, for the, um, continuation um, of the Merkel politics. Mm -hmm. So people know him, um, but they also know that he would do some things differently. And he, um, like in the eyes of the voters, he has like the most competencies in all these fields I mentioned before. 
Um, and Ilya, you know, picking up on where Janina left off about Olaf Schultz, you mentioned like he, he really, like you said, uh, he had this moment in time, this turnaround, and he actually was able to attract voters from the CDU. Um, is that because Merkel's leaving the stage? What, what do you attribute to that? I mean, can you talk a little bit about how the voters drifted away from the CDU? Um, yes, uh, we heard yesterday that there are uh, 1.3 million voters coming from the CDU to the SPD. That's uh, really much. Um, and um, I think it's because Olaf Schultz and Janina said it like that. Um, he's also doing politics from the center. He's not um, the person for radical change. And um, voters, I think, uh, are hoping that with uh, Olaf Scholz as chancellor, there would be some change, but not a radical one. There would be um, a there would be politics from the center and also um, in a in a style of Angela Merkel, uh, next to the topics now, no um, media and 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 stage and um, yeah, big chancellor moves, uh, just doing politics. Uh, I think that sounds easy, but it isn't. And we saw other um, examples in history, like Gerhard Schröder. Uh, who uh, had a very other uh, type of doing politics. So I think Olaf Scholz is um, trying to, or he tried his campaign team, tried to use this image and to be uh, maybe like a second Merkel, but, um, uh, and it was really, um, it was really clever because uh, Armin Laschet could not use this um, narrative uh, it was not possible for him. He was uh, all of his years doing politics was next to Angela Merkel, um, especially 2015 migration politics and the discussion about this and uh, growing up from the AFD. Um, but he, he was, uh, he is, not he was, <laughs> he is another type of uh, politician. Um, and he's very emotional, for example. And uh, sometimes I think maybe Janina thinks uh, this also, he was in this campaign, he was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm a chancellor candidate. Yes, uh, okay, I'm here and um, yeah, what can we talk about? And it was not so professional and Olaf Scholz was so, so uh, straight in doing his job and doing his campaign. And that's what Germans like. So mm -hmm. I think he, he was very clever and the SPD was also very clever to, um, I think if we remember this, to, to um, sign in Olaf Scholz as candidate 12 months before he was a candidate when all the other parties were not even thinking about this election. And he was a candidate starting with 14%. And, so it was a very long way for the SPD, but it was very clever to, to really have a plan for this election because it was this just this one moment. Um, and this they, uh, they knew this because this one moment when Angela Merkel uh, will um, uh, 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 not longer be uh, there as chancellor. So I do want to get to the coalition talks since we are in that phase already, actually, or will soon embark on that phase. But one more question about sort of the results. Um, you know, there was a wave of protest parties during the tenure of Merkel or sort of the era of the Grand Coalition, first with the left party that emerged, right? And then during her tenure as well, the um, growth of the AFD on the right side of the political spectrum. Um, do you think that the that um, the pr these protest parties on the fringes um, still have potential for growth, or have they sort of hit their ceiling now that younger voters are looking at the FDP and the Greens? Um, Janina, why don't you start? And I'd love to get your thoughts, Yulia, as well. I think um, first of all, it's good news. It's good news that uh, the parties in the center um, have had higher values in this election, especially because in, uh, when we look at the participation rates on these elections, there a lot of uh, people went out and did their vote. Uh, there's 
actually a very good sign uh, because at the beginning of this year we were constantly asking like how does corona change the voting behavior do people actually go and uh, do their vote and yes they did so that's a good sign I wouldn't think that um, the future of the AFD or the link would be over um, so I think um, that can change quickly or it needs to be like a consistent strategy out of um, coming out of the parties in the center um, to, to fight the parties on the right wing or on the left wing if they, if they want to do so. Um, Julia, do you agree? Has it been a victory for centrist parties in Germany? Yes, yes, I agree. But um, thinking about the AFD, I think we have to uh, to see different things. They they got their core voters, and we know this, and they are about 10%, 10, 11, 12, maybe, and um, they will be there. And that's also the case because the AFD will also be there uh, in this parliament and maybe also in four years and also in uh, uh, like Berlin or yes, yesterday, mecklenburg vorpommern But they also... Um, when they couldn't call up the protest voters this year like they did before, especially um, when we are thinking about the, the election 2017, there was this main topic migration and the discussion about this and also um, um, the, the uh, demonstrations, uh, Merkel muss weg, uh, Merkel has to go and um, uh, this was not uh, um, possible this year. They they tried to to use Corona and being against Corona politics uh, like the topic like uh, migration, two thousand seventeen. But um, it was not um, it was not catching voters. So I think they will be there. Yes, and um, it's also in my opinion it's a normalization if we uh, have a look in europe and other countries next to us that there is a party right from the cdu from the conservatives it's not so so um it's not a german problem i think but um it's it's um uh, we are looking at this more than others, I think, because of our history, and that's clear. Um, but I think they will be there, but m more than with co uh, core voters, about 10%, then um, having much more voters. But we will um, have a look in the future, uh, what will happen. We talked about Afghanistan, migration problems worldwide, um, and it's possible that there will be a change and that they will get some movement with these topics um, and then also get more protest voters maybe uh, in uh, next elections in next years. So, um, you know, different coalition colors and permutations have been sort of what, you know, a lot of German Germany watchers have been thinking about um, before the polls closed yesterday. And even though the votes have been cast, we still don't necessarily know who is going to be chancellor after Merkel or Merkel's successor. Um, what are your thoughts? Do both Armin Laschet and Olaf Scholz have a mandate to now form a coalition, which looks like it's going to have to take two parties um, to get a majority together with either the center left or the center right, specifically the Greens and the FDP? Um, or going back to the dreaded Grand Coalition, which most people don't necessarily foresee. Uh, what do you think, Yuli, I'll start with you this time and then we'll go to Janina. Yeah, I think there are two, just two options, really two options. Um, the first will is the traffic light coalition with the leading Olaf Scholz um, and becoming chancellor. And um, for this, I think there are um, the results are one thing. The other thing are the polls and the, the poll ratings the last weeks. And also if we saw that Olaf Charles gets so many approval ratings for him to become the, he, the candidate factor to become the chancellor. And also that voters or the poll said um, the SPD has to lead the next uh, federal government. So. Um, I think this is the more realistic option today, but who knows what is tomorrow. Um, and the second one is Jamaica. We called a Jamaica flag with um, CDU and CSU, the Greens and the FDP. And um, I think the, the results of the CDU-CSU were so dramatic 
they lost over 16% since 2013. So it's such a range that it's really, mm, I, can't, I can't understand at the moment if there is any chance, uh, chance and any thinking um, with the Greens and the FTP to make Armin Laschet or to become Armin Laschet uh, the next chancellor in because of this results. I, I think it's really, um, I will not say unbelievable, but I, I'm really crazy or thinking about if this is really would really happen. So I think the traffic light coalition is the more realistic one. And also time plays against Armin Laschet because um, they, they will have a constitution, uh, uh, they will uh, have an inauguration now the next days and in, in between the 30 days also the parliament that they will talk about, okay, who will de do which job? And I mean, Laschet would stay there and say, oh, nobody does any job because I have to wait and I have to see what will they happen. Mm -hmm. And if Olaf Charles did all these discussions in th three or four uh, months, maybe then it's my moment. And I think the party will not do this with him. I think it's it's possible that this situation would split the party really or split Armin Laschet and his party. And um, for this, this you could not have any interests. Actually, Janina, why don't I take that question and add a little bit more from what a viewer is asking? I mean, Armin Laschet has not thrown in the towel, um, although it could be that the ship has already sailed. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it now seems like the, there's been a power shift and it's really the two smaller parties, the Greens and the FDP, that are in the driver's seat and need to hash things out. And then they can decide who should perhaps give them the best deal for what they both want. But do you think the FDP and the Greens will be able to bridge their differences when it comes to, you know, transforming to a green economy and um, fiscal policy and budget policy? In, in a, as a citizen, uh, that's that's my biggest wish that they manage, and I think it's a very smart uh, decision to say, uh, like last time, it didn't it didn't work out because uh, we pitched from both sides to CDU, CDU said said no to both sides, and then. Uh, the FDP, the Liberals said, okay, we're going to stop. We don't do any coalition uh, with you two parties. Um, I think it's very smart to do it uh, the other way around and also to, like, in, in order to have, like, a good power in negotiations. I think uh, the Liberals and the Greens, they, there is an umbrella that uh, they share together. They, both parties um, look for progress in terms of digitization, in terms of, uh, I know, change in society, um, education, for example. There is big, big differences when it comes to pensions, for example. Um, and like, of course, the approach of the Liberals is always, different um, than the, the approach from the Greens when it comes to which role should the state play. Um, but I like from what I read, <laughs> and it's really, that's really uh, like an answer I give as a citizen and not as a pollster, is that both parties really have, really want to uh, take this serious and want to do some change and take also the the mandate of the voters series, because that's what I said before, um, voters want to have a change in, 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 in the way that things go ahead. <laughs> we don't, uh, as they don't want us to stand still. And um, also in like, it's, we, we did first polls after the election uh, yesterday, and people are actually in favor of the traffic light. light yeah. and, 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 in, and in keeping that in mind, um, Janine, a quick follow up from somebody. Um, so would it be disingenuous then for the Greens and the FDP to then go to Armin Lasha and see if they can get a better deal with him? <laughs> I mean, it's 
it's everything is now possible, I would say. So, I mean, in the end, uh, no one can say <laughs> even even the CDU and the SPD could go into a coalition if they just say we want to want to stay in power. They could do that. It's not the favorite position, uh, the favorite coalition um, for the Germans, but it, it is technically it's possible. And I think it's it's now really a power play uh, between the parties. And that is also something that makes it so interesting to follow now because I mean, Laschet is apparently good in having negotiations. This is how he got the job as a chancellor candidate. The entire party, like the entire, like, a, like a huge share of his own party was against him because they saw the approval rates. And even like, so in the, in, in society, he hasn't had the best approval rates at all. And it, it didn't make, make sense in the beginning of the year to nominate him. Uh, it was party politics uh, that make, made him win, but also his, ability to just stay there and stay until he wins so maybe uh, that's what we can see once more i don't know um it's it's going to be interesting to follow um and just one quick question actually to julia um, a viewer would like to know a little bit more about your take on the afd and its performance in um i guess in Turingia and saxon is it concerning that they came in first and also, since it was a federal election, but there were also state elections in um, Berlin and also in Mech Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, um, was the SPD successful also because people thought down ballot? Did they ride on the coattails of Olaf Scholz or were the candidates popular themselves in those states? Sorry, you have uh, the last sentence was away from me. <laughs> oh, um, it, it was, you know, were Giffey and um, I guess mm -hmm. Manuel Schwiese, were they able to carry their own or did they benefit from the um, uptick from Olaf Scholz? So I think um, they did, but uh, especially Manuela Schwiese in Mecklenburg Vorpommern did it also on her own. Uh, she's very uh, prominent. She's very. Um, she's a really leading woman, and uh, like Malu Dreyer also in uh, Rheinland-Pfalz, for example. And um, so I think it was it was nice to have the the wind of change with from Olaf Scholz and um, mm -hmm. this this situation in the polls. But it was not so important for her in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern as maybe for Franziska Giffey in Berlin. But um, the situation in Berlin is very special. I think it's not easy to explain because the, the um, coalition from the SPD, the Linke and the Greens um, is having really special uh, city topics of Berlin. They are talking about um, uh, and mobility, for example, and also- um, uh, Affordable uh, housing. Yes, yes, of course. And um, so, I think there were was a special situation in Berlin, so I, I got no no um, information, but maybe Janina has if uh, the the situation the polls for Olaf Scholz um, were had some effect of this what happened in Berlin. So maybe Janina, you sure you know and, something before, about this before we go back to Janina, quick very quickly, Yulia, the AFD yes. in the former East, they're basically yeah. the party to reckon with regionally there, right? Yes, at the moment, I think so. And um, it's also a very special situation because, yes, they, they got the first uh, in Turing or in Sachsen, but also they uh, were by with 20% uh, on the 30. And so it was not as good as 2017. Um, uh, also in Berlin, they lost 7%. And um, yeah, I think maybe it's like I said before, they are there, but at the moment they are not growing. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I think all politicians and especially the CDU uh, has to to see what happens in the East in Germany and what have to, and they have to ask themselves, um, what can we do? To, to manage this, to get in touch with the people again and all the non-voters and all the protest voters they are having there. Um, but I think it's not a situation we have to, to fear about at the moment because um, 
Yes, because in some t sometimes I think we can say it's a regional problem, but I do not like this. This. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I wish word. we had more time to get into the, all the different um, results and what they mean, but maybe I'll end with one quick question. Do you think we'll have a government before Christmas? Yes or no, Janina and Yulia? What do you think? It's the most asked question now on every panel discussion. <laughs> and um, I really don't know. I, I to be honest. Fair I, enough. I, Fair I, enough. You what do you think? I think if it would be a traffic light coalition, then we have. If it would be a Jamaica one or any other idea we can uh, have, uh, then Mrs. Merkel would do the, the um, Christmas words uh, right, to the, the New Year's Eve address. Yes. Yes. Well, um, Janina and Yulia, thank you so much for your insight. I'm now pleased to hand over the baton to Ambassador John Emerson for our, our little own elephant runda with <laughs> Marilu Zobek and Sigmar Gabriel and Rupert Poland. So thank you both for being with us today. And we will sign off. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Suda, for the introduction. Um, and also, thank you, German Marshall Fund, uh, Atlantic Brooke, and the American Council for Germany. Uh, I see we're joined also by David Deisner of Atlantic Brooke and uh, Steve Sokol, president of American Council in Germany. It's just great to have all three organizations together uh, chairing this. And uh, we have a great panel. So you heard sort of an assessment of where are we now, what's been happening, what happened on election night. Uh, this panel, we have three very, very experienced former Bundestag members, ministers, minister presidents, and uh, we are going to get their take on what is in store for us with the uh, coalition negotiations and potentially with the, uh, the new government. We've got with us the Honorable Mary Louise Beck who was in the first class of the Bundestag where the Greens actually participated in the Bundestag back in 1983. And she served for a couple of terms and then went and joined the Landtag of Bremen, came back to the Bundestag in 1994 and served for 23 years, finally leaving in 2017. And uh, today uh, she uh, is the director of the uh, Central and Eastern Europe of uh, Central and Eastern Europe at the Zentrum Liberale Moderna, which she co-founded. So, Mary Louise, it's great to have you with us today. Thank Hello, you. Hello, good to see you. Thank we you have my dear invitation. friend Zigmar Gabriel, who. Um, uh, oh, thank you, uh, dear friend Zigmar Gabriel, who, of course, most recently was the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, and Vice Chancellor of Germany. Prior to that, he was the Minister of Economic Affairs and uh, Energy, uh, and that was during uh, my time as ambassador, so we had a, a good connection there. And uh, before that, he was the Federal Minister for the Environment. He was one of the longest serving members of the leadership of the Social Democratic Party from 2009 to 2017. He hails from uh, Niedersachsen and is currently the chairman of Atlantic Brooke. So, Zygmar, thank you for being a part of this. Hi, John. And then Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Ruprecht Polens, who was a member of the Bundestag from 1994 to 2013. So, he left just as I arrived as ambassador. I won't take that personally. Uh, but uh, he was representing, of course, uh, a member of the Christian Democratic Union. Uh, and uh, throughout uh, his time in Parliament, he served on the Committee of Foreign Affairs, in fact, chairing that committee from 2005 to 2013, a very, very important uh, time uh, in the life of, uh, of that committee. After leaving politics, he became president of the German Association for East European Studies. So thank you, sir, very much for being with us. Thank you. All right, well, let's get started. And, uh, you know, I'm going to bounce around. I, I hope this is more a conversation than uh, an interview per se. I do want to say that uh, people should feel free to use the uh, question and answer, um, uh, you know, the question and answer uh, peer, uh, opportunity, the Q&A key 
uh, to ask questions and we'll try to feed some of those in. But mm-hmm. let me start, uh, Zygmar, I'm gonna start with you. I, I mean, you were the chief negotiator in after the 2013 elections in negotiating with Angela Merkel to form a, the, what became the grand coalition in that 2013 to 2017 timeframe. How does that process work? And, and what can we expect uh, from uh, these multiple negotiations that are gonna be happening, I assume, simultaneously after this election? First of all, I think the Greens and the Liberals did a very smart move yesterday evening when they said, okay, guys, whoever will be the chancellor, the first meeting will be among the Greens and the Liberals, uh, and they will discuss where is common ground. I I, I can't remember that this happened uh, uh, before in in any other elections. It was always a strong party who invites the smaller one. Here, the, the two smaller ones, Invited the the uh, uh, invite themselves, and I think that's 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 very interesting uh, move. I think we will see a red uh, and, and a traffic light government before uh, Christmas. It will not be so difficult to form the government. Uh, um, it will be a government which uh, has to be much more ambitious in climate issues. That I don't think is too difficult among the Greens and the Liberals and the Social Democrats as well. Um, And in many other areas, we will see more stability uh, than maybe friends from abroad would expect. Uh, But I don't think that they will need a lot of time for their negotiations. Uh, And uh, again, (laughs) I found it absolutely smart that the two smaller ones invited uh, um, uh, themselves. And we will see, by the way, for the first time in German parliament, where no party is dominant. You have two parties around 20% or above 20%, three um, above 10%, but no dominant party. And this creates a new atmosphere in the parliament. And... um, well, by the way, when Olaf Scholz will become chancellor, and if it would be Laschet, it would be the same, they will represent less than 20% of the voters. If you count the non-voters, uh, then you will see that the backing on, among the uh, citizens for the next chancellor is around 20% in our society. That's also something absolutely new. I think they will have it in mind uh, because they need, if they want to run longer than four years, um, they need the support uh, from a broader part of the society. And this was, will also be something which they will have in mind. But again, on Christmas, we will not see Merkel again uh, with a Christmas speech. I think it will be the new chancellor. Wow, that's uh, it's different from a lot of the commentary that we've heard recently. Uh, you know, pretty interesting. I mean, I've read a lot of folks saying that uh, we would expect the Chancellor to be Chancellor Merkel to be giving the January, the New Year's speech. So, um, I just before I you know start moving around, just to follow up, you you mentioned you thought it would be an ample coalition, a traffic light coalition. Uh, and it would, it would come together pretty quickly. What gives you such great confidence in that? It's, first of all, the psycho- psychology of, uh, of uh, the, the election day yesterday. It was a disaster for uh, the conservatives, and uh, they, uh, we will see um, a conservative party which will have a lot to do to, to, have a new, an, 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 to develop an idea of what a conservative party should be in the future. They will be much more inward looking than, than they will be able to negotiate with other parties. Uh, you see they are, the, the enemies of Mr. Laschet, they are starting going around and discussing about who should be the next leader of the party, who should be the next prime minister. So. They are, they are looking inwards, not out, outwards. And the second is, I mean, the Liberals and the Greens, if they would have a Jamaica coalition and to vote for Armin Laschet, you, you, must, you, you have to explain the public why you are electing 
the biggest loser in the last elections and the biggest loser uh, ever in the history of the Conservative Party to become the next chancellor. And the guy who won, by the way, more than 5%, if you remember uh, three months ago, the, the Social Democrats were at a level of 14, 15, 16%. So he really jumped up to 25 uh, you have to explain why this guy should not be uh, the next chance. It's on a psychological level very difficult to explain, although conservatives and liberals will have be more uh, common ideas for politics than maybe the, the Greens and the Liberals and the Social Democrats. But I think the psychology is uh, in favor of getting a traffic light coalition. Well, and that's interesting. The well, right. are, and the conservatives are really destroyed, uh, and uh, it's it's it seems to be for me not clear what kind of party will develop there. Well, let me that 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 obviously begs the question to Herr Pollens. Uh, <laughs> you know, are the conservatives really destroyed? Are they devastated by this? It was. It was. It was. Of so course, will they a just very... be inward looking. Or do you see a road for Arm and Lashet to reach out to uh, to the, the and the Liberals and, and try to put together a governing coalition? And then I'm going to go to Frau Beck, who really is going to be holding the cards here because her party is going to really determine which of these two folks are chancellors. So think about that. Uh, Mary Louise will come to you in a minute. But Herr Polens, what's your reaction to what Zygmar had to say? Yeah, of course, it was a very heavy defeat uh, on this uh, election day yesterday. And uh, it is obvious that uh, you cannot say we have been defeated and now we want uh, to run the country. But on the other hand, uh, Sigmar Gabriel described uh, pretty well that we have now four parties and uh, they have to form a coalition out of three. And this means um, a side of psychology uh, all parties try to get something for their programs, for their, uh, for, for their voters, and uh, they might agree to a coalition where they can present their voters uh, most of uh, their program in the coalition treaty. And it is true, we have on the one hand, uh, Social Democrats and the Green Party who would like very much to form a coalition. We had on the other side, uh, Christian Democrats and liberals who would prefer to be in a coalition together. And one of the two, either the liberals or the greens have to move uh, either away from the social Democrats or away from the Christian Democrats or to them. And to the party who is moving, let's say in the, in the other camp, will get a lot for that, of course. And this might lead to a situation where the Greens say, we can get from uh, uh, Christian Democrats nearly everything what we want to achieve in climate policy. And then it might be tempting, I don't know. Of course, if I would, uh, would have to, to, to bet right now, I would also to bet for a traffic light uh, coalition but uh, we will see. It is. Uh, um, it could be that it is a fast negotiation, but I'm not so sure. I would say I just don't know. It could be also rather complicated. You must unmute yourself. Uh. Uh, thanks, Mary Louise. I'm just in. Uh, in 2013, Merkel only was four seats short, and that thing went all the way towards the end of December. So who knows on these things? But but let me let me turn to uh, Mary Louise Beck. Uh, so the Greens are holding a lot of cards here. I mean, you know, honestly, you've got this agreement now. Uh, you know, or not agreement, but discussion with the Liberals about what can you agree with and who you're going to approach. But, but how do you see the uh, Green Party approaching these negotiations? And what in particular are their red lines uh, or the most important aspects that the Green Party would try to get out of the negotiation 
And which party, the, the uh, CDU or the uh, SPD, do you see as most likely to deliver on those um, important uh, principles? Well, it was no secret that the Green Party feels close to the Social Democrats and that their first choice would have been red and green together and repeat what uh, happened in 1998. I think uh, we must uh, give a few words to the, the development that the choices are not as big anymore and thus not the possibilities to blackmail each other. To be honest, I was afraid that um, there would have be a, a, a voting um, outcome where the red and the green uh, could have been uh, starting to negotiate with the liberals, pushing them so much to the wall because they thought in the end, we will have six or 7% from the Linke. And this option is gone. And that makes things a lot easier. I never believed oh. that, um, that uh, Scholz would really take the Linke uh, into his government. He is too much of a realo in a positive way, I would say, being, of course, not discussing leaving NATO, of course, keeping up the transatlantic alliance uh, and, and much more. Um, but I'm, I was glad that this option is gone because, of course, it forces both liberals and greens to really be rational, to be modest to a certain extent. And if I look back uh, when Jamaica did not work out, it was exactly more due to psychology than due to real reasons. It was because the black Merkel and the green negotiators, all they had to do was sum up, look at each other and they understood each other. And the liberals really felt out. And they saw this coming for the next four years. And that's when they said, come on, that not with us, that's committing suicide. Okay. So I think we do have more rational, more experienced and more modest leaders now. Um, uh, I think that I, I, I would uh, agree with Digmar Gabriel that Scholz uh, is somebody who does not fuss around long. <laughs> he is somebody who does not talk for hours and hours, but uh, goes for decisions. So I also think that uh, the chances that there will be pretty quick negotiations uh, are good. For the Green Party, uh, in the first in the first case, they are, yes, they don't feel so close to, to the Christian Democrats, but also helping the obvious loser back to stay in government. You don't do that. You just don't do that. And I'm quite sure that the German voters would not like it at all. This was a election for change. So they must find a way to respect each other in their difference. And you don't need coalitions. <laughs> there is not people with different ideas and especially way of, um, a way of addressing things. It's not that anybody would say we don't have a climate problem and others. The, the difference will be in how shall we address it and that course, will need negotiations. Well, they, you know, a couple of questions have come in from the audience. And one uh, is how the liberals and the Greens are going to overcome the major policy differences they have. Now, look, everybody wants to, to address the climate. That's not going to be a huge problem. I, I agree with you. It's all going to be in the details of what are the policies. But they have pretty major differences on health policy, energy policy, agriculture, and in particular, budget and fiscal policy. Uh, you know, it doesn't take um, a genius to know that uh, Lindner is going to want the finance ministry as part of the price of being part of a coalition. Uh, how do you see that discussion uh, getting resolved, uh, you know, Frau Beck? Um, I don't see the big difference in health uh, politics. That system is so big and 
it's almost impossible to really move it in Germany. Many, many experienced ministers have uh, made that, uh, that dramatic experience. Um, I think on climate, if you listened, you could have seen that the Green Party has developed, that they understood you can't do it without the market and you can't do it with new intelligent solutions and te technology. It is not... Uh, back on the trees, like uh, Graf Lambsdorff said, uh, I think something like 30 years ago. So I think there are possibilities there. The fiscal question, yes, will be difficult. Um, but again, um, the, poss the, the, the possibility to really go much higher with German taxing and thus strong, strangling uh, our enterprises the green will understand that. So I think probably they will find solutions to go away from the black zero where investi investi investigation, not, not investigation, investment into the future is being taken and, and keep flexible on this, uh, on this level. This is my estimation. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Herr Polens, a question is another question that's come in is: uh, Would there be any possibility of another grand coalition? Of course, I think given what all of you were saying about uh, there, there's no way you can have the loser then be at the top of that. That would be the CDU as the underparty, if you will, to the Social Democrats. Any chance you, you see of that happening uh, uh, from your perspective, from the perspective of the CDU CSU? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I always thought that the grand coalition was not the best thing for our democracy because uh, as we see it right now, uh, you have uh, 16 years uh, my party running with Angela Merkel, 12 of these 16 years together with the Social Democrats. And uh, usually you might have said as a voter, uh, they are all exhausted, let's try with the opposition. But uh, it's not sufficient. The opposition of uh, liberals and uh, Greens are not sufficient to form a government on their own. They need either the Social Democrats or the Christian Democrats to form a, a three-part uh, uh, coalition. And uh, um, so a grand coalition, as we have had it now for such a long time, is not good. It will not happen again so soon. So I don't think so this will happen. Uh, okay, thanks. And, and I saw, Zygmar, you were shaking your head no when I raised that question as well. So I assume that's your perspective. I have a, uh, and you can expand on that if you'd like, but I have another question for you as well, which is um, you, uh, it, it, when you were doing these negotiations, you were both party leader. And um, uh, well, I guess you were the party leader when you were doing these negotiations. You, you uh, in 2013, you weren't the the standard bearer, but you were the party leader. Um, so now you have Olaf Schultz as the standard bearer, but he's not the party leader. So, and there's, as, as you talk to people in Germany, a lot of them say, well, you know, Olaf Schultz is more center left, but boy, the leadership of the uh, social Democrats and the rank and file of the social Democrats is very far left. And they're going to be the ones that are going to be dry process and how it works, will uh, Olaf Schultz really be neutered in this process or not? I, I, I would imagine he's the one that brought them there. So, uh, and then secondly, if that is the case, what does that mean when it comes to trying to negotiate with the, with the liberals uh, who obviously would see that there'd be a bigger gap between where they want to go and where a much more left-leaning social democratic party wants to go? What are your thoughts on that? John, it's, I think it's very easy. Of course, the leader since yesterday evening, the leader of the Social Democratic Party is Olaf Scholz. But he, he's not formally the president of the party or the chair of the party, but he, he's the leader of the party. And uh, um, I, I would, would say whoever uh, m makes his experience with, with, with the Social Democrats, my experience is for the first two or three years, they will follow whatever he wants uh, wherever he wants to go, because they will remember that 
with, with a more leftist leadership, uh, they, they had 16 or 15 percent. And when they brought Schultz uh, in the center of the campaign, uh, at the end, they had 25. So this was a campaign which was absolutely concentrated on him. He has every argument to say, I'm the leader of the party. Uh, maybe he, he don't want to run as a leader of the party, but, but he has the power. Uh, and I think for, for some years, it will stay. Maybe my party sometimes get crazy if they are too <laughs> long in if they are too long in power, then they overestimate their own uh, ideological ideas. But this will need some some years until now and for the next years. He is has a very very strong position, uh, and uh, I, I I don't think we we will see any grand coalition during the next years. Uh, by the way, it would not be a grand coalition, <laughs> but would would be a coalition between two twenty percent parties. Uh, and the third is, I think the biggest challenge will not be for these three parties, for the traffic light coalition, will not be in interior politics, uh, not in, in, in climate, uh, not, not in taxation. It will be Europe, because there you have a very progressive part of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this traffic light coalition. That's the Greens. They are the most European orientated party. Mm -hmm. You have parts of the social democrats who also want to be more progressive, especially when it comes to a common fiscal policy in the European Union. We see that uh, after the pandemic, uh, the gap between the richer part and the poorer part of Europe is widening. And so the question will be, what, the, the, what are the, the richer, what are they willing to do uh, to stop these widening gap because it's inside the eurozone and there the liberals are I sometimes call them economic talibans they don't want to step in for a more progressive um, uh, uh, politics in Europe and on the other hand side you have the greens and parts of the social democrats that will be not so easy but it will not be play out during the coalition treaty you will find some uh, headlines and then they will go into the negotiation after the government is formed with other European member states, and then we will see how how they will uh, um, how they will find compromises. It's not a problem for the first round and the negotiate negotiation of the coalition, but next year and over the next years, Europe is the real challenge for the for every German government. Well, that's a that's a really uh, really interesting point, and I know there uh, you know there are a lot of tensions in Europe uh, between the sort of the creditor nations and the debtor nations, and this whole idea of fiscal union is a huge uh, flashpoint and and sort of a a deal breaker, I guess, for a lot of folks in Germany. Uh, but um, uh, you know, Mary Louise, uh, what what is your sense of uh, what an ample coalition, for instance, would mean for the EU. I, I mean, I, I actually uh, take some comfort in the fact that, you know, everybody in this, of the four parties, everyone seems to be pretty pro-European. Of course, the question is, what does that mean and how does that, how does that play out? But particularly on the fiscal issues that Zygmar was mentioning, what's your sense of, yes. of where we might up there? Just a moment, one tiny remark before I answer your question. Again, if that uh, um, the social democratic left wing, if they are playing it too strong, they lead to the outcome that they are out. They are driving their own party out. So, I mean, if they don't want to be in government, okay. But this is, uh, as you know, this is not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I think you believe into your party less than I do, Zygma. <laughs> wait, wait, by the way, we, we, we Democrats are having the same issue in Washington right now, <laughs> let me tell you. Well, the, the Greens can be pretty crazy also. So which party can't um, look at the decision they took on the candidate uh, with the Christian Democrats? But OK, talking about Europe, yes, we do have the, the real question of the fiscal union. This also would have been difficult between the Christian Democrats and especially France if we would have had the old uh, uh, coalition going on. 
Um, so I think this will really um, be upcoming years, which which really demand a lot of responsibility from politicians. And, and finally getting the message that the world is not turning around the EU. <laughs> and uh, I think we have not quite understood that. Um, and this is number one. We see it with the Americans. Yes, it was blunt the way they were uh, moving now. Um, and maybe it could have been a, bit, a little bit less blunt. But uh, on the other side, um, it showed us that this, you better wake up. Uh, the Americans are not going to take over everything in the end, pay for it. And we come and say, well, uh, they are always playing the world police. You know? <laughs> so um, we must hear that there is lessons. And who else could we wish than Biden? I mean, uh, so we had, we got our chance with Biden and actually we understood. I want to make one more point being so, uh, so busy and linked so much um, to Middle Eastern Europe. It's not only about the European Union, if I may remind that. It is really also thinking Euro the European Union other than a former and still nowadays Western bloc. And we are walking on a very difficult path. We need Poland, uh, we need the Baltic states, we need Romania, uh, even Sweden once in a while is upset. Uh, and there is a lot of things to do looking at the East, also including the question, what do we do with Russia, which obviously does not want to be our friend at the moment. So a lot of questions, much more than about fiscal politics. Sorry, keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, well, well, that's uh, you know, that's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting approach. I mean, so we focused on the EU. Uh, what about the transatlantic relationship, uh, Herr Polens? What's your thoughts on what uh, this new government, uh, what what its approach, whatever it ends up being? But I mean, everybody seems to think that ample coalition is the most likely of the scenario for the transatlantic relations for the and for the German American relationship in particular. Yeah, of course, uh, in the coalition treaty, it might uh, look like or it might be written that we have continuity with regard to our general approaches to foreign policy, European Union, transatlantic relations, NATO, and so on and so forth. But the problem is, um, uh, if the treaty is signed, politics starts. And the politics uh, who is starting is not just what is written in the treaty. It depends on the world if we are discussing uh, foreign policy. And we have a developing, let's put it neutral, a developing relation between China and the United States. And I think we can analyze that this is a predominant uh, point for American foreign policy. Uh, America will be very much focused on that. And this means that the United States might ask everybody to take sides. And of course, we have a lot in common with our concerns uh, with Avi China. Uh, we don't like this authoritarian approach, the violations of human rights. Uh, uh, Tibet, uh, Taiwan, and many other points. But uh, as far as I could see it from the past, the European Union is much more focused on solving these problems via talking, using trade as a tool and something like that. And the US thinking is a bit more also, uh, uh, yes, trade, of course, but sometimes also confrontation. And confrontation um, is easier done if you have two. One 
in the White House and one in Beijing. If you want to confront with 28 and one in Beijing, it's a bit more difficult. And um, uh, I would also like to, to make a point uh, with regard to the German role in the European Union. You had now many articles how Angela Merkel worked, worked it out that the, she could broke so many compromises in the European Union. It was also because she had a very strong standing in the, her own government and within Germany. I, I agree to the analysis that the new chancellor, be it, Sigma, uh, be it uh, Olaf Scholz or Armin Laschet, would be much weaker. He would much more depend on, uh, on at least two other parties and maybe sometimes also on its own party. And this uh, might change also the negotiations around the U Council of Europe and how the European Union is trying to get to results. So uh, you have, uh, this might be also a weakness of our uh, proportional system, parliamentary democracy system with, uh, in comparison with the French system, where you always have a rather strong president uh, who can act uh, very uh, on his own if it comes to foreign affairs. And therefore, I would expect that maybe this is a message uh, to the United States, a very timely one. Uh, Macron might play a bigger role in the Europe of the future. And therefore, uh, I, I use this opportunity to say it would be uh, at least a good idea uh, if there are new alliances with Australia and Japan and India and all the others, um, you should not put the others uh, uh, in a way, uh, confront them with a fait accompli as it has been in the past, I guess. Uh, here there are wounds and there are also uncertainties about US behavior in the future. Also, uh, the, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, was executed in a way that many allies, I guess Germany included, felt a little bit uh, outruled, overruled, so that we have a lot of problems which we think could have been avoided if uh, uh, the withdrawal of, of everything would have been planned better. But having said this, uh, I really am a convinced uh, transatlanticist. I chaired the German Atlantic Association for some years, and I'm a convinced European, and I do hope that we have really continuity, but in a very much changing world. And uh, this is a challenge for every new government. The world is changing very fast. And last remark, um, we need also a foreign policy with regard to climate change. What are we doing, for instance, uh, in foreign policy to convince Bolsonaro to stop cutting down the rainforests uh, around the Amazonas? We are just complaining about that but we have no idea to offer him uh, a funding or uh, to, to say, if you continue, we might in, in, uh, endure sanctions. We need this kind of foreign policy also with regard to climate issues, not, not only with regard to trade issues or uh, uh, security issues in, in, a, in, in a net more narrow sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Zygmar, question for you. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, her opponents raised the issue of China. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that the Greens tend to be a little tougher or wanting to be a little tougher on China and on Russia, for that matter, than uh, uh, certainly the, you know, the two parties that are going to be trying to form a governing coalition. And, uh, you know, I guess my question is, you have an ample coalition headed by um, Olaf Scholz with the Greens and the Liberals part of it. Uh, what does that mean for China? What does that mean for the, um, uh, you know, the German China or the EU China investment deal that's sort of languishing right now at the, at the EU? How do you see that playing out? I mean, of course, the Greens have a much more offensive position when it comes to the situation in China or Russia. But at the end, I mean, um, it does not change the, the economic fundamentals in this country and in Europe. 
Um, if you don't want to discuss Germany, maybe Australia is a good example. The country is much in much more confrontation with China than we are. They just made this deal with the UK and the US in their sub for their submarines. But they joined the free trade agree agreement with China, as well as Japan did and South K Korea did. And so I only want to raise the, the issue. Yes, we have, when it comes to security issue and human rights, we have a lot of confrontations with China. On the other hand side, we have a lot of interest in the economics. And I mean, the Green Party is right when, it, when, when they are calling for a more ambitious climate policy, not only in Europe, but all over the world. But if you are in a tough confrontation with China, they will not be part of a green deal in the climate issue. Uh, Secretary Kerry just tried to get um, access to the, to the Chinese leadership and he was sent back home. Uh, and they, the Chinese said, come back when the trade war is over. So I, I always listen carefully to those who say we have to have a more clear position towards China, but at the end, you need cooperation when it comes to climate, to fighting against pandemics, against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So a more confrontive position, I don't know where, 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 where it's changed the fundamentals. So yes, there will be maybe a more outspoken policy to human rights and other issues through the Greens, but I would bet a lot that coming back in three years, the principal relation to China will not have changed. We are frenemies, enemies when it comes to our political system, our idea about society, but economic partners when it comes to the, the, the economy. And that's the reason why it's not so clever to call it a Cold War 2.0, because in the first Cold War, we were economic much stronger than the East and that's different to China. We need also kind of cooperation and to, to check where confrontation is necessary, but where are, um, the, where, where are the necessary areas of cooperation? This will be one of the uh, um, challenges for Europe, not only for Germany during the next four or five years, or maybe 10 years. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, I got one final question. We're going to go around the horn. We're playing Let's Make a Deal. And uh, the question for Let's Make a Deal is, given these negotiations and given where, where you all think they're headed, who's going to be finance minister? Who's going to be foreign minister? Who's going to be economic minister? And who's going to be the next president of Germany? Will it be Frank Walter Steinmeier for a second term or someone else? So, Mary Louise, I'm going to go to you first. Those well, positions. Let's make a deal. I can give you one answer. I think I know who the next president is going to be because that was publicly announced already. Um, so we will have Frank Walter Steinmeier for five more years. Uh, all the other questions I know are decided in the end, not with Kuhiba anymore. I remember that Joschka Fischer and Gerhard Schröder retreated in the end with one, two, I don't know how many bottles of wine and this uh, Kuhiba. <laughs> and uh, I never saw uh, Olaf Scholz uh, smoke, but I tell you, those questions are going to be talked about the most because it's wonderful to speculate who will be what, but it will be decided in the end. And then you will have the guys sitting with a plan on the table, who gets what, who has to be uh, pacified. Very important. I guess the leftists have to be pacified within the Social Democratic Party and within the Green Party, old, an old tactic pacify those who are against the project. So I just wait. 
So you wouldn't even say that, uh, you know, Lindner is finance minister under these circumstances. Anything could happen is sort of your view. I didn't Depending on how good the wine is and how many cohibas are smoked. <laughs> All right. Okay. Air Pollens, what's your, uh, what's your take on that? Finance yeah. minister, foreign minister, economic yeah. minister, president of Germany. One of the advantages after a lost election is that you can speculate on these personal topics. Uh, but uh, I would say I like that Frank-Walter Steinmeier will be the next president for five more years. I think he has done his job uh, very good. I really do expect that Linda will become Minister of Finance because otherwise, in my view, the Liberals will not join the coalition. Uh, and then, of course, the Greens have the next choice and they might choose uh, foreign affairs. And then Annalena Baerbock, who told everybody she is coming from international law, uh, might be, uh, <laughs> yeah, Marie-Louise, <laughs> uh, might be uh, the, the first choice. And then we might have new ministries. I would, I would think that the Greens will really try to form a ministry for energy, climate, part of economics, and look that uh, Robert Habeck will, will get it. And on the other hand, uh, of course, uh, the Social Democrats try, will try to form a strong ministry around uh, 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 work and, 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 and social security uh, with Hubertus Heil. This is what I would expect. Interesting it would be who will become Minister of Interior, which party would, would get it, probably the Social Democrats. And now I have speculated enough, and uh, in our next round, we can, we can look if I'm right or not. And Zygmar, you get the final word. Does, you uh, know, it sounds like we got two votes for, uh, uh, for Frank Walter Steinmeier. Continuing, you're going to have a, a Social Democratic president and a Social Democratic chancellor. Uh, and then obviously the other three positions. Your, your successor once removed, I guess, as foreign minister, uh, economic minister, also a successor of yours, and, uh, and, and, and of course, finance ministry. I agree to what uh, Rupert Colin said. I think uh, that's the, the, the most likely outcome. Uh, yes, um, it could be possible that somebody has to be pacified. That's true. But um, um, it, why do uh, you? Usually, <laughs> why do you? Should, I can call my wife, and she will tell you uh, yeah. what's, what's her position to this question. And I, I think uh, that, that Olaf Scholz would even ask Armin Laschet to be chancellor before he asked me to come back on the government. Uh, um, but 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 uh, to be honest, I think that's a, that, that that's a rational in. Getting uh, the or, uh, get, bringing the finance ministry to to the liberals, it would be very difficult for them to explain not to have the finance ministry, uh, taxes and 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 budget and other issues. Second, uh, um, in Germany, it's a tradition that the defense ministry and the foreign ministry is not in this in the same party. If you are in a coalition, I I have my doubts that that the Greens are interested in getting the defense ministry. Uh, and I also have my doubts that the liberals would like to have it. So then the social democrats will get these ministry, and then the foreign the foreign office will be maybe by, by the greens. It depends how big the climate ministry will be. I'm sure that Ruprecht Pollens is right. Uh, th that's the question for the greens. Will they really be able? to uh, get on track on the climate issue, because if not... Which will... means, excuse me, infrastructure in the wider sense. It's, it, infrastructure. It's all, whatever they yeah. need, yeah. Whatever they yeah. need yeah. To, 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 to bring Germany back on track, that will be their interest. Their core interest will be climate. Uh, there are parts of in this, uh, infrastructure. There, there are many issues part of, of that. Because if they would not reach the climate targets in 2030, you will see a second Green Party, which is much more radical. So they, they have to do whatever they can do to, to, uh, to bring together the powers they need to fulfill the climate. And, and then, unfortunately, I would say the Foreign Office is 
part of part of the, the, the gambling part of the negotiation. Uh, it's not any longer so important because the the main decisions are made today in the chancellor's office and between the heads of state and government. Uh, but it's likely that the Greens will get the foreign office and the, as Mr. Poland said, the Ministry for Interior will be uh, for the Social Democrats. Well, that is very interesting. There have been lots and lots of questions uh, wondering that. You've given us a lot of food for thought. We've gone four minutes over our time, uh, and I need to pass the baton to David Deisner for our next extraordinary panel. I'd encourage everybody to uh, stick around. We've got uh, two of the top journalists in the world uh, who are joining us. But uh, I want to just thank all three of you for joining, uh, for your candor, uh, and uh, you know, for uh, supporting these different organizations. And Sigmar, I'll see you in Washington D.C. and not not too distant future. So choose, Phil and Doc. Bye bye. David, bye. Over bye. to you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much, John. Uh, and a very warm welcome here from Berlin. Uh, my name is uh, David Deisner. I'm the executive director of Atlantic Brücke. And I would like to welcome you to our next session, which is entitled The Next Germany on the World Stage. So uh, in the first two sessions, of course, we have focused more on uh, interpreting, analyzing the election results. And now we'd like to widen the perspective a little bit. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome two really renowned and outstanding journalists who will be joining me here on the panel. First of all, we have Anna Sauerbei. Um, Anna Sauerbei uh, is an editor and writer at the German daily newspaper Der Tagesspiegel since uh, 2011. Um, she also writes a monthly column on Germany for the op-ed pages of the New York Times. Anna, very good to have you here today uh, on the digital panel. Thank you. And also with us is Stephen Erlanger. Stephen Erlanger is the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times, a position he assumed in 2017, and he is based in Brussels. Uh, Stephen, very good to have you as well on the panel. Thank you. Now, let's start off with a more uh, general question. You were both following what is happening in Germany from different vantage points uh, for a German and a big US newspaper. What do you make of the results? Uh, Anna, let's start with you. Is there anything that surprised you in particular? No, I think, uh, and I think you've discussed, that, discussed it before. Um, it wasn't really surprising. Um, as we've had pretty accurate polls um, ahead of this election. But at the same time, I do think it's a new beginning and it's an entirely new situation for Germany. Um, we have now, for the first time in Germany, the situation that two of the smaller parties are going first to start coalition talks, not coalition talks, but start talking about who could form the next government. And they will probably... Um, make the terms um, and uh, offer a government to one of the larger parties, probably the Social Democrats. And this is pretty new and we'll see how our political culture can deal with that. Stephen, your thoughts on, on this pretty complicated result of these uh, German Bundestagswahl, what's your- Well, I have to say, I'm very impressed by the polls because in with so many parties to get it so accurate really is is remarkable. I'm struck by fragmentation. It's happening all over Europe, but the Volkspartei, it's vorbei, it's gone, it's finished. You know, to have a chancellor of either kind with a quarter of the vote is a weak chancellor. And to have a three-party coalition is, you know, it's about compromise. Now compromise is a good thing, but it's not always a good thing after 16 years of a sort of stagnation in my view, but I'm also pleased to see that the extremes have suffered a bit. Die Linke may or may not make parliament, the AFD has gone down from 12.6 to whatever it is, 11, but I'm still very struck by the east-west divide and I'm hoping, just personally, having lived in, in Germany myself and having first visited Germany to the Hauptstadt der DDR, that there will be some thought given to the East in this new government. Thank you, Stephen. Um, now let's look at foreign policy. Foreign policy issues have not really played a major role during this election campaign. 
And I do remember that Germans have often criticized that a substantial renewal of transatlantic relationship, of transatlantic negotiations on, on various foreign policy issues was so difficult after the Trump years, as the Americans were so much inward looking. Wouldn't it be fair to say the same applies to Germany, Anna? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this uh, campaign, and I think we've we've stressed that too, um, is has been completely void of any foreign policy issues. Um, of course, the departure from Afghanistan came in the middle of the German campaign, and was discussed a bit. And um, also the question of where to deploy the German Bundeswehr in the next years, whether to deploy it at all, and to what for with what means and and to what goals and ends. Um, but uh, th that was just a, a brief interlude uh, in a campaign that was pretty much focused on uh, social issues, on climate change, um, on interior issues. So Germany is pretty much looking at itself. And um, But I don't think that the next government will be able to do that. So I hope that we will see some foreign policy initiatives uh, with whatever government we will have. Thank you, Anna. Um, Stephen... Merkel is Angela Merkel has you know always been not only you know highly appreciated because of her um, you know ability to mediate to moderate uh, and in fact she has been a great manager of many crises and it was her unique quality as a leader um, you know to 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 mediate but this kind of incrementalist balancing approach might have come to its limit some people argue and maybe for Germany, a more forward-leaning approach might be necessary, given the, the conflicts we are facing at the moment. Would you agree? Um, I would agree, except I don't expect it. I mean, I'd like to be wrong. Um, I was struck, much as Anna was, by the lack of foreign policy discussion. But of course, I don't know of a democracy that actually debates foreign policy during election campaigns. Certainly, America doesn't. Um, it's important, you, you know, but um, I do think, however, Europe waits and Europe is anxious because it's not just her personality, of course, it's the weight of Germany. And that's why I was disappointed not to have at least a more thorough discussion of Europe and the responsibility toward Europe in the campaign. Instead, you get all this rhetoric about, oh, we're for a stronger Europe, but what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean in terms of defense spending? What does it mean in terms of, of uh, collective debt, perhaps to help pay for climate change? What does it mean in terms of inequality of, of sort of regional problems? What does it mean for rule of law? Germany just matters for all of these things. And, and Germany, and of course Merkel too, has been this balancing wheel between East and West but, um, and between the South and the North Somebody has to do that. Um, I think, you know, either chancellor candidate could do it, but as, as the sort of new boy, it would lack a certain kind of credibility. And also as a chancellor with not a huge uh, mandate, frankly, even at home, there would be skepticism. And then you have, of course, Emmanuel Macron, who has his own very clear ambitions the French run the presidency of the EU from um, the 1st of January. But the window between that, the formation of a new German government, whenever that is, and the French presidential election, which is in April, of, is very narrow. So I think people have to be kind of very patient and not have huge expectations. Mm. Stephen, you actually wrote in an op-ed not uh, a very long time ago that also maybe the, the, the kind of power system within Europe will change because as you emphasized, uh, Angela Merkel has not only been a media because she has also been a very dominant figure in Europe. Um, and you wrote, and I quote, it is the moment French President Emmanuel Macron has been waiting for. Um, what has he been waiting for? And will he, would you argue, become more powerful, more influential? Will he really have a more formative influence of, you know, how Europe will look like in the future? He certainly wants to have that. I mean, he's the one with the ideas and a lot of them are very good ideas, frankly. I mean, he wants more integrated Europe. He wants a Europe that's better able to defend its own interests 
um, to stand up for itself, to be more resilient. All that sounds fine. And of course, if, if he's reelected and if his party does well in June legislative elections, then it'll be easier for him. Certainly he knows he needs Germany on his side. That's clear. Um, and my guess is he would prefer Olaf Scholz, but who actually knows for sure? Um, because Scholz at least seems to have with Macron an idea of fiscal integration that needs to be better if Littner will let him do it. Um, so it's all to play for. I mean, I'm very curious to see what Draghi does, but you know, it is a collective, it's 27 countries now and, and you win in a sense by making allies. Macron has been very bad at making allies. So the first thing he's gonna to have to do is make an ally of the new chancellor, whoever that is. Hmm. Anna, would you like to add on that? Or? Yes, I think it depends on the coalition, but uh, if we have a traffic light coalition, I'd be pretty optimistic that we may see some progress in Europe because um, especially on, I think, I think you're right, Stephen, to, to stress that financial integration in the European Union, we would have a block of social Democrats and Greens who are really in favor of more financial integration. And I went to a press conference this morning with Olaf Scholz, he was asked about it, about the recovery fund. And he said, well, we can do this in a way, I'm not quoting him, I'm, I'm uh, just uh, conveying what he said. Uh, we can do it in a way that we, we have already done it in a way with a recovery fund that protects Germany's interests. And at the same time, gives us some fun, more, um, more space uh, in Europe to act as a community on the financial markets. And I think he will go forward with that. And I think the Greens will be on his side and maybe they, they I see some possibility to uh, convey that to, to the Liberal Party as a good idea. Um, and I think they, they will be more forward um, what, when it comes to Europe than Angela Merkel does because she had to deal with a lot of skepticism within her own party when it comes to financial integration. Uh, she took the chance when it was offered to her um, in May last year at the height of the corona pandemic uh, with Europe threatening to fall apart uh, in many southern countries. Germany was indebted to uh, from a moral point of view at, the, at that point because uh, we hadn't um, delivered medical gear to Italy um, at the point when it was needed there. So she took that chance and she did it, but I think that we would see a more structured and ambitious um, way with Annalena Baerbock as a possible foreign minister and Olaf Scholz in the chancery. Mm. Well, let's talk about some of the, you know, obviously more difficult foreign policy issues that we are looking at these days. And this is, of course, first and foremost, first and foremost Afghanistan. Uh, the, the rapid unraveling, uh, uh, Afghan's rapid, uh, rapid unraveling has really, you know, raised doubts about America's role in the world, about America's credibility as well, um, particularly after the, you know, Trump years and uh, America's promise to be back and also backing its allies. Um, but we also see now that backing American allies, you know, is not unlimited uh, and uh, that, you know, many Europeans and many Germans in particular have been taken by surprise um, of how, you know, quickly uh, the US decided to uh, withdraw from Afghanistan. Um, do you think that this has done harm uh, in the long run, really, to the transatlantic partnership? Uh, how how bad is it? How damaged is is our um, transatlantic partnership, of which we had hoped that it would be revived uh, with a new administration, Stephen? Um, you phrase all that very gently, I have to say. Um, there has been, obviously, a degree of shock, a sense that America would choose one ally over another ally, for instance, in the case of Australia and France. Afghanistan, I think, will fade. I, I think there's been emotional outrage um, and perhaps shock, but uh, it's a little bit hypocritical, to be frank, because there was a lot of consultation with NATO allies. The allies didn't necessarily like what the conclusion was, but they certainly had a chance to talk 
and I've reported this out through all NATO ambassadors, there was very little opposition to what Biden wanted to do, not in April, not when he was there at, at the NATO summit in June. Everybody knew Biden was going to pull out. Now, the fact is they screwed up the evacuation. I think the Pentagon really took advantage of, of the White House, but this is a complicated thing to try to describe. But I think it's American competence that took a hit. Um, America's commitment to NATO is not harmed, I don't believe at all. And I was very struck that most Europeans who were in Afghanistan, frankly, were, had been willing to get out years ago. I mean, it was clearly an American decision. They went in to help America. And once America decided to leave, they, why would they stay? They didn't have any national interests there. And there were interests in, in helping the society and helping women and so on. And this is the tragedy. This is the emotional damage. It's the embarrassment European politicians feel about Afghanistan. Um, they're embarrassed. I don't think their sense of American credibility is really been cut away particularly by Afghanistan. Then maybe um, a little bit more this understanding, which many in Europe had anyway, which Macron has argued for some time, which is structurally America's changed, it's less European, it's more diverse, it's, um, it's, it's, it has more minorities, um, this started under Obama. It even started with the Iraq war, to be honest. And, you know, Biden is kind of still an American national interest first, but he's Europe's friend. And frankly, I say to my European colleagues and friends, be careful what you wish for. You may get exactly what you dread, which is a second Trump term. So, think about who your real friends are. Thank you, Stephen. So let's now look at the election result again and the potential future German government and what this government's take will be on transatlantic uh, relations and our relations with uh, uh, the United States in particular. And, and I'm also uh, including here some questions from our audience and, and I quote, uh, it looks, uh, highly likely that the Greens will be in the next government, of course. They have had a more outspoken position on China and on Russia. How do you think their involvement in the next coalition will impact policy uh, towards these two countries? Any thoughts on that, Anna? It's hard to say yet. Um, I do think uh, that um, particularly with regard to Russia, we will see a more forward and outspoken policy if the Greens join the government. It's uh, one of their core issues, it's human rights. So it is with the Liberals um, who stress that very much in their party platform. Um, on the other hand, the means are limited even for the next government. Um, when it comes to questions like Nord Stream 2, the Greens have been very outspoken not to start the project or even pose a moratorium or even uh, not ever let it um, be in function um, at all. Um, I don't think that would go with the Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Um, he said just this morning that, well, now, um, now it's built uh, and we um, do stick with the guarantees we have given to Ukraine. Um, but uh, he, he did not elaborate what he wanted to do with it, but I, I took it as now it's built and now we're gonna run it. Um, at the same time, uh, standing with Ukraine on the guarantees. Um, and I th think that could be a line. On China, um, Annalena Baerbock was asked about it in a programmatic um, foreign policy interview in April she gave to the FAZ, which I can just recommend. Um, for anybody who speaks German, because it's really, um, it, it, it goes down the list of issues and um, she, she's really, um, she really says something about everything. And, uh, but you can also see that uh, she doesn't really have uh, a recipe to offer. Um, I think she it would certainly be different in meetings with Chinese government officials. Um, the human rights issues would be tabled maybe in a more, open, um, ambitious way, 
But at the same time, and I think we've heard, I've just heard the, the last minutes of the, the panel with Sigmar Gabriel, and I think he's right in saying that, well, we can't turn back the great dependency of Germany's economy on the Chinese market within a four year uh, legislature. So they will have the same um, issues to deal with. Um, and they will maybe do that in a different tone, but with the same limited means. So I don't expect like a reversal um, of the policies. Stephen, what's your view on this issue? Germany finds itself in this dilemma, obviously being economically dependent with our exports to, to China, particularly goods, car industry, whereas at the same time, of course, we also want to stick to our values and the Western values of democracy yes. and the freedom of speech and so forth. So that really uh, has, you know, confronted Germans uh, with, with that dilemma in also the Transatlantic Partnership. partnership. Where are we headed and what's well, the room to I maneuver? Think, the new government? Well, that's true. I mean, I think China is the issue more than Russia. I'm a little less worried about Russia, right? I mean, Nord Stream 2, okay, fine. If there's no market for it, it won't work. I mean, it's um, very simple to me. And Ukraine has been promised. Now, China, my view is Germany... I think Anna would agree, I hope, has been shifting anyway. It has a harder look at China. I mean, Xi Jinping's China today is not the Xi Jinping China of five years ago or six years ago. It's certainly not the China Merkel first visited 15 years ago. Um, and it's, it's much more aggressive, much more clear about its ambitions. And it presents a much bigger threat to Germany and to Germany's industries to the Mittelstand. It's eating Germany's lunch. And Germany is very bad, seems to me, one, you know, this may sound ugly, but where's the German computer? Germany's very slow on electric cars. I mean, Germany has to move into the future. And China, in a way, holds it back, it seems to me. And the BDI has been much more aggressive than the government, it seems to me, also in understanding that China is a market, but it's also a threat, and it's a threat for the future, and, 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 and it's not a partner that reciprocates love, put it that way. So um, I think it's toughening. Um, I do think Gabriel and Anna is right, it'll take some years, but I think German industry understands the change is required. The biggest problem is auto stuff. Now, how much Laschet is gonna help with the auto industry, I have no idea. But um, I do think it's, it, it is much more conscious. And of course, there are human rights issues, all that, there's Xinjiang, blah, blah, blah. But the biggest problem is German foreign policy in general is led by its market export model. And as one changes, the other has to change, it seems to me. Yes. I mean, if I may add, I think that some of the... Um climate uh, policies that the Greens are um, supposing and that the Social Democrats have, um, let me put it like that, uh, decided to support um, will bring greater independency for Germany's energy markets. We're now at 46% renewables uh, and it will have to grow at a rapid pace. And all three parties that could participate in uh, traffic light um, uh, government have promised to speed up um, planning times for uh, windmills, um, speed up and support um, the industry to become uh, gas uh, independent or more independent of gas um, uh, that, that's obviously coming from, from Russia still in a great part. So I think that would maybe give Germany more independence from the market. Um, we see we see energy prices rising right now in in Europe, and I think that's going to be a big issue this fall. It uh, hasn't really um, hasn't really uh, been a big issue in the past weeks because we've been so busy uh, discussing coalition options and looking at the election. But I think it it will um, dawn on people when when they look at their bills uh, in the fall uh, and when they will have to start turning the heater on in Berlin. Um, and uh, I think then energy independence will be a big issue that uh, this coalition will have to work mm. on. Yes, and, and how to do that by weaning Germany from coal, which is really a problem. That's part of the hypocrisy about climate in Germany, I have to say. 
Mm. Would you be optimistic that uh, on the climate agenda we will see kind of substantial progress, really, or, or you know, would only be lip service? Uh, I, I mean, you know, there are ambitious climate goals uh, in the Biden administration. Of course, this has been a major factor, really, also in the uh, election campaign, not only for the Greens. Uh, what's your view on the future transatlantic dialogue on, on climate? Will we see progress? I would say it has to come. I mean, by law, the EU has mandated this sharp reduction by 2035. I think we all underestimate, at least us non-technical people, how expensive it's going to be and how difficult it's going to be and how politically unpopular it's going to be. So maybe they won't make the targets precisely, um, but I do think it's headed in the right direction. John Kerry certainly cares. Um, I mean, but the problem is as ever, having a policy toward China that may not want rivalry and cooperation. Maybe it doesn't want cooperation. Maybe it only wants rivalry. And, if, and maybe the price for cooperation will be considered too high. This is partly out of our hands, but I think this is one of those delicate things. We elect smart politicians to help us through. Thank you. Anna, we have a lot of questions actually from the audience uh, and many of our viewers would like to know more about the kind of transatlantic orientation of the different parties and also the implications, you know, of various uh, coalition called constellations that we might see. So could you elaborate maybe a little bit more on, uh, you know, where we would see the greatest overlap and in, in terms of programming orientation, maybe with what is important at the moment for the Biden administration? Uh, so from, you know, from that angle, which of the parties is the most transatlantic or, the, you know, the fittest for uh, joining dialogue with the Americans? And, you know, traditionally, I would add, it, it, it was um, argued that maybe on the, in the political left in Germany, they might be more critical of the United States, whereas in the conservative camp that have traditionally been the transatlanticists. Has that changed at all? What, what is your take maybe on the Greens, the Liberals, the Conservatives uh, and the SPD? I think it greatly depends on the policy field we look at. Um, I think with the German left, anything that's geopolitics, that's military cooperation, 2% goal um, will be difficult. We have strong opposition within the Social Democratic Party and the Greens to the 2% goal. In a traffic light coalition, the liberals will be the only one strongly supporting that. Um, in any government headed by Armin Laschet, which uh, I don't think is very probable looking at the, how the day is evolving here, um, but uh, that, that will be the most um, classic uh, transatlantic government, I think, uh, continuing along the lines of Angela Merkel. Um, Armin Laschet has made it clear that uh, when it comes to foreign policy, he very much sees himself in Angela Merkel's tradition. And uh, the uh, conservatives, of course, um, have been a strong proponent of NATO and um, upgrading Germany's military, uh, meeting the 2% goal. Um, they haven't, and they, they have alongside the Social Democrats worked to raise Germany's uh, defense budget in the past four years. Um, I think with the left government, we could see new projects um, uh, that could maybe, um, well, sort of be a pacifier for uh, anger uh, and disappointment in the geopolitical military field. Um, Annalena Baerbock has suggested uh, forming an alliance for climate neutrality, and I could see her um, meeting John Kerry on that, as Stephen said. Um, and Olaf Scholz has very strongly worked with Janet Yellen and the Biden administration to pass um, the global uh, minimum tax uh, within the G7 and the G20. And I think I, I see a strong field of cooperation there um, of fairer taxes for big companies, um, not just, um, and, and also maybe in the realm of a common uh, digital um, legislation. That might also be an opportunity, right, Stephen, to get out of these kind of, you know, worn off kind of conflicts, talking about for months and months. Uh, do, do you see potential here for? Well, I do, and, and those arguments get tedious. I must say, I 
have strategic autonomy fatigue myself. You know? <laughs> um, but I do think one of the things that's interesting perhaps for Germany, I think NATO, particularly the Americans under Biden is, and, and there'll be a new NATO secretary general, which would be interesting, could be Parli, could be a woman, we'll see. But I think it would be more interested in developing a broader idea of what 2% involves than it does now that may appeal more to a center left German government because it in, could include intelligence. It could include anti-terrorism stuff. It could also include climate stuff, right? I mean, it, it, there are lots of ways of measuring 2%. Um, and and I, I think NATO is being pushed to kind of loosen up on that. I mean, I, I, I think generally, um, you know, Washington and Berlin do fairly see eye to eye on things. Uh, it, Germany doesn't want the US to go home. It doesn't want NATO to disappear. I mean, this is part of the core DNA of Germany as much as Brussels is. And um, I don't think it's gonna let that happen. Also, I think people in Germany understand that a real European defense initiative would take a lot of integration, would take probably treaty change and would take military spending of four to 5% of GDP. I don't think people wanna do that. So I'm, I'm pretty calm about all this, I have to say. I mean, there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of emotion, but I think in this weird world we have where you know, Russia is all, wants to divide us. China wants to divide us, you know, uh, dem demographically, economically, as the West, we're simply less powerful than we used to be, which Merkel kept talking about. It really is incumbent upon us to kind of figure it out and stop eating each other alive and think together, like on tech and trade, of what our real problems are. Anna, but there are still um, some people <laughs> in the Social Democratic Party, but also in the Green Party, who are very critical of US presence and in particular nuclear weapons being uh, based in, or stationed in, uh, in Europe. And they would prefer these weapons to be removed. Uh, others would argue, well, this is really at the core of our uh, you know, Western security architecture. And it would be just it's naive to assume that uh, you know Europe could defend itself, or that it, you know there is any good argument for for uh, you know kind of kicking the Americans out of Europe in, in terms of military presence and in particular nuclear weapons. What is your take on that? How will these parties manage to reconcile these internal tensions? I seriously don't know um, because it is uh, it's um, it's a sleeping issue, um, but it could come back uh, any time. And uh, Olaf Scholz certainly um, will try to keep it down as long as he can, um, because there's still very strong opposition in his party. And some of the people, um, for example, Rolf Mützenich, uh, who has been the leader of uh, the uh, Social Democratic Caucus um, in this past legislature and will certainly play a bigger role uh, in, in, the coming, in the coming years if we have um, Schultz as a chancellor um, because he has to give some posts to, to the left and um, uh, Mützenich would certainly be one of them. And he's been very outspoken of removing American nuclear weapons from Germany. Um, the same is true for Annalena Baerbock. Um, that's, um, as much as the party has moved away from being a pacifist, party to a party that has supported um, every single deployment of the Bundeswehr in the past years. It has always voted um, for the Afghanistan mandates, for example, for the Kosovo mandates, etc. cetera. Um, but in this point, there's still sort of a, a nostalgia for uh, the uh, Greens of the 80s. Uh, and Annalena Baerbock has said that she would make it an issue. She, she wants to address it. Uh, within the context of um, NATO Russian um, nuclear proliferation talks. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe it's naive to, to think that uh, Russia would uh, um, 
agree to uh, remove some of its weapons in return for American weapons being removed from Germany. So, but I, so it, it, that's definitely a stumbling block. Stephen, would you would you think that this might be a matter of concern, maybe for the U.S. administration, looking now closely at uh, what is happening in Germany, that kind of these currents within the parties might also mean a shift in in foreign policy priorities, in particular in defense. Yes, I very much agree with that. I mean, there are Americans who actually are in the weeds of what the whole nuclear sh sharing issue is, and they realize how neuralgic it is in Germany. Um, at the same time, militarily, technically, it's probably not necessary to have these nuclear bombs sitting in Germany to be supposedly carried on German bombers that might get shot down very easily, right? So, you, you know, given sub-based missiles, given air-launched cruise missiles, it's not militarily crucial, it seems to me, that these sit in Germany, but there's a political aspect and there's a tie to the alliance aspect and there's doing our part against the Russian threat aspect. And this is something in a way that NATO cares about and Germans need to resolve for themselves, but nobody really thinks these are the most practical weapons. At the same time, I think it'd be good if people would realize how vulnerable they actually are to Kaliningrad-based Russian missiles, which are dual use, um, which could take out Berlin in 15 minutes, right? I mean, so there's an issue here of of um, deterrence, which needs to be modernized. Um, but politically, it's, I agree, a very, very difficult discussion to have. Mm -hmm. um, sorry for meandering a little bit between topics, but I would like to give our audience again a chance to um, ask a question here again on China. We have just uh, talked a lot, not about China, but another question here on the China issue. And I quote, uh, this is more coming from the German perspective, so I think it's quite interesting. Why do Americans seem to believe that geopolitical rivalry with China will inevitably lead to confrontation? In Germany, we are concerned about uh, Xi Jinping's authoritarian government and, and about uh, his uh, desire for regional dominance and interference operations in Europe. But we see the need and the potential for cooperation on issues like trade and climate change. Who has the right perspective, our viewer asks. Um, any thoughts on that, Anna or Stephen? Um, well, I would just say, I don't think the Biden people want confrontation with China. That's not the American goal. The American goal is not to stop China's rise. It's to deter China from doing anything stupid and from attacking our allies and being nasty to the Australians and taking over Taiwan and blocking sea lanes. It's about deterrence. It, it's about looking at the new Chinese threat, which now has more naval ships than any Navy on earth, which is developing very sophisticated, untreaty managed intermediate range nuclear missiles and ship killing missiles. It's China's ambitions that worry people, not any desire to confront it. Um, and cooperation would be, I think, everyone's favorite option. So I just think in the question, there's an assumption which I just don't agree with. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would agree. Um, and I don't think Germany has the means to choose either path. Um, I think they will have to, well, Using, using her word, do some meandering too in, in this respect. Um, uh, the Greens will certainly try to um, get China to do more on climate change, again, with uh, very few pressure um, to build. Um, but with the dependency of Germany's economy, uh, I hardly see any harsh confrontation. I think what we will see is um, along the lines that we've seen with this government recently, uh, some more symbolic moves like sending a chip, ship to um, the Indo, uh, Indochina region. Um, I think that 
they may continue on that path. And I think that's what the liberals would support too. Uh, and we would see that with the Chancellor Amin Nasha too, I think. But mm -hmm. it is, it, it would be rather symbolic. It's, uh, well, yeah, just um, embracing, embracing the partners in the region and uh, first of all, embracing America's interests. Can, can I also add that it, don't underestimate China's own self-interest in controlling climate change. I mean, China has this huge population. It's done more on electric cars than most countries. It's done more on, on solar panels. It's still building coal plants. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't want to die either. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you know, before we close the this session, I would like to ask both of you maybe with just one brief sentence to tell us why we can be hopeful uh, with regard to the transatlantic partnership with a new government. What what gives you hope, uh, Anna? Well, I think as I as I said before, uh, what gives me hope is that I see new new projects on the way in in the realms of climate change and. Um, globe taxation. Steve? Well, I would say that both chancellor candidates have made their own commitment to the transatlantic relationship explicit and strong. And I have no reason to doubt that commitment. There's nothing wrong with making Europe stronger. It doesn't mean you're harming the transatlantic relationship. In fact, I agree with Macron, it may actually make it better. Thank you so much, uh, Anna Zabrai and Stephen Erlanger, for uh, sharing your perspectives, your very thoughtful remarks and your analyses. That was very helpful for today's uh, digital panel here on the German election results. Many thanks also uh, to our audience and the many uh, very thoughtful and uh, clever questions. Thank you so much for sharing that. And of course, to all our viewers who participated in that event. And of course, also to the partners of this event, uh, the German Marshall Fund and the American Council on Germany. Thank you so much and uh, goodbye. Have a good day. Happy to. Bye bye. Ciao.